Well, thank you very much, Augusto. My name is George Gorslein. I am the IARU Region 2 Secretary, and I want to welcome everybody to tonight's presentation, which I'm looking forward to because even though I have uh, some call signs which say I've been around a couple of years, satellites are one of the things I really haven't had a lot of experience with, so I'm looking forward to uh, learning some new things tonight. This is now the fifth online workshop we've done in Region 2. We started with the idea of doing two or three, and the interest snowballed. Uh, the numbers that Augusto has been collecting, Augusto um, OA4DOH, because it doesn't show up on his, uh, on his um, uh, image, uh, he volunteered to be workshops coordinator, and I don't think he realized how much work he was getting into, because We've had over 4,000 views of these workshops, not counting tonight, between the YouTube video and Zoom, where the Zoom and some people watched YouTube live and many, many, many people have um, used the YouTube videos after the fact as well, and they're still there. And at some point, we're gonna have enough uh, to qualify that we can actually set up a properly named IARU Region 2 channel which will make us a little bit easier to find than one of these strange links that you have to put up with today. Um, before I introduce our speaker tonight, Patrick, let me just briefly explain for those of you that don't know what IARU is and what, what it does. IARU, the International Amateur Radio Union, represents the worldwide interests of amateurs to organizations such as the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. And in the ITU, as you know, there was a World Radio Conference last year. There's one every four years, usually sometimes three. That's where the spectrum gets divided up. And where IRU becomes very important there is we're not a voting member of, I, uh, of ITU, but we are uh, an observer member, and as such, we're allowed to, to participate in meetings, we're allowed to uh, influence people, put our points of view forward, but only national entities, you know, United Nations states, actually get a vote. Why this is really important is we live in a mobile age, there's not enough spectrum to go around, and for many governments, we're freeloaders. Governments love radio spectrum. They can sell it and it doesn't cost them anything. So they can sell licenses for all sorts of commercial services and they can view us as, why should we bother with amateurs? We can't make any money from them. And that's a very important thing for us as amateurs worldwide to be able to represent what amateur radio is, what its value is, both for emergency communication, for experimentation, and for support of things such as STEM, science, techno te technology, um, education, in all the disciplines, engineering and math. Very, very important for us to do that. Now, Region 2 of the IARU is the organization that I belong to, Jay Bellows, Gustavo Franco, uh, Augusto, we're part of that. Region 2 is the same as the regions of the ITU, Region 1 being Europe, Africa, Region and Middle East, Region two, 2 being the Americas, North and South America, and Region 3 being Asia Pacific. So for example, we have the president of uh, IARU Region 3, Visnu there from Indonesia. It's already tomorrow morning for him, but good morning to you, Visnu. Oh. Uh, good morning, Joss, and good morning, everyone, and good evening to you uh, for your time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I forgot a very important person here. In fact, one of the most important people in Region 2, Jay Bellows, K0QB, because he's our treasurer. <laughs> he keeps track of all the money for us, so my apologies, Jay. I'm trying to keep track of three things at the same time. Okay, that's what Region 2 is. Most of you are familiar with IARU and you're members of your national society. Most everybody here, well, we have some people from the Caribbean. I know it's Trinidad Tobago's here, uh, but most of the rest of the people here are uh, from Canada, the US. Your national societies would be ARL and our RAC, Radio Amateurs of Canada. 
if you are joining us tonight and you're not a member of your national society, please consider joining because this, these are the kind of things that we sponsor and we make happen, which I think are important to the growth and preserving amateur radio for the enjoyment of all of us. So end of the marketing pitch, but I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. I think it's important. Uh, many, many people feel, why should I spend money on, uh, on my dues to, to belong to that society? Uh, what's I, what do I get for it? And simple answer is, if our spectrum goes away, we're going to have some very expensive toys collecting dust in the corner. So maybe, maybe that's one reason to think about. Okay, for tonight, let's get to the main event. Patrick. Good evening. Patrick Stoddard. WD9EWK, and he also went and got himself a Canadian call too. Victor Alpha 7 Echo Whiskey Kilo. He's a director on the AMSAT Board of Directors, and he's also an AMSAT ambassador, having served as an ambassador since 2006. He's also a technical support resource for ARLIS, amateur radio on the International Space Station. So he's been working with satellites since 2005. So he looks you but he's obviously somebody who really understands this and has, has spent a lot of time with it. He was first licensed in 1977 and he, had his, he picked up his Canadian certification in 2002. And with that, it's time for me to shut up and give the floor over to Patrick. Now, in terms of the format for tonight, hold your questions until after his formal presentation. We're gonna mute everybody's mics, just jot your questions down if you're on YouTube, do the same thing. We'll monitor YouTube chat. At the end of Patrick's uh, presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. So everybody will have a chance to, uh, to ask their questions. Now, Patrick, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me get the full screen, uh, you know, get my uh, slideshow up. Uh, does that look, you know, you see a full screen with a bluish background? Yes. Okay, well then, then I learned from my test session on Monday. Good evening, good afternoon to everyone. Still afternoon here in Arizona. Uh, I'm Patrick Stoddard. I've, you know, been an AMS, I've been doing AMSAT satellite work for a long time uh, after not being able to put up antennas to do HF uh, at the different apartments and houses I've lived in. So this is one way I've dealt with homeowner associations. Uh, you know, that's, that's me. And I do want to, before I get into this, I do want to thank the two gentlemen who gave last week's uh, presentation in Spanish on this topic, Matias Graño, uh, LU9CBL in Argentina, and Guillermo Guerra, who is present with us uh, this evening, uh, XQ3SA in Lima. Uh, good, you know, good evening again, Guillermo. And uh, these two were very helpful. Uh, in putting together this presentation uh, that I'm that I'm doing tonight in English, uh, you know, an agenda that was, you know, if anyone was watching last week's presentation, is similar. But I've given talks like this uh, uh, many times over the years, so it's n it's not much uh, not much different than what I've done in the past. Uh, a lot of things to talk about, but we'll get through it and. And the uh, questions, I am not looking at any of the chat questions, but I, you know, as George said, I'll be happy to answer questions uh, at the end. Uh, what is a satellite? Uh, there are two types of satellites, the natural satellite and artificial satellites. Although hams can make use of the natural satellite for a uh, moon bounce or EME, I'm not talking about that tonight. We'll be dealing with the artificial satellites uh, that orbit the earth. Uh, you know, that we can use for communications. Uh, many types of satellites, uh, uh, communication satellites, weather satellites, we, we use satellites without even realizing it. Uh, navigation satellites, uh, you know, GPS, GLONASS, our phones have that, or we have GPS receivers, uh, astronomy satellites, and the International Space Station is an example of a space station. Uh, you know, Radio amateurs and satellites. I actually gave a talk specifically about the history of amateur radio in space related to the space age years ago. Uh, 
amateur radio has been part of the space age from just about the be very beginning, about four years after uh, Sputnik 1 was launched, uh, Oscar 1 was launched. Uh, Oscar 1 was the first non-government, non-military satellite put into orbit. It, Telstar was the first communication satellite put up in 1962, Telstar 1, but amateurs led the way with having Oscar 1 as a secondary payload on a spy satellite that was launched from California in 1961. So all, you know, approaching six decades ago. Uh, after the beginnings with the first few satellites in the 60s, uh, the AMSAT organization uh, in the US and North America, commonly known as AMSAT NA, was founded in Washington in 1969. Uh, continues uh, supporting amateur radio in space. Uh, there are other AMSAT groups around the world that either build and launch satellites or they support and contribute to other groups that are building and launching the satellites. There are AMSAT groups big and small worldwide. Uh, when we talk about satellites, satellites are in different types of orbits. You know, most, you know, almost all of our satellites that we have right now are in low earth orbit, you know, 200 to 2000 kilometers, about 1200 miles up. Uh, they orbit the earth, their period is about 80 to 150 minutes. Uh, we don't have any satellites currently in medium earth orbit or high earth orbit, although amateurs used to have satellites in a high elliptical orbit. Uh, but our friends in Europe, Africa, you know, Eastern Brazil, stretching to the Southeast Asia have access to a geostationary payload, uh, Q0100, uh, which, you know, out here in Arizona, I'm well beyond the footprint of that. But it's, in, you know, it's been good to hear and read about what the hams in that part of the world have been doing with a geostationary payload that's available 24 hours a day. Many of our satellites now uh, are CubeSats, these small cubes that are 10 centimeters or four inches uh, on each side. Uh, amateurs and universities and other groups have made use of the CubeSat format for building and launching satellites. We've had larger satellites in the past and we can still build them, but the big drawback for amateur radio has been the cost to launch our satellites. Uh, CubeSats, you know, barring free launches from agencies like NASA, uh, the launch costs are more manageable on an amateur radio group budget uh, as opposed to paying many millions of dollars for a larger satellite to be put into orbit. Uh, AMSAT's uh, AO91, AO92 satellites are examples of the 1U or the 4-inch cubes uh, that are working day and night. Uh, with re, you know, FM repeaters in them, and AO92 also has a camera that's periodically activated. A single four-inch cube can hold everything short of a rocket motor. Uh, you know, power source through solar panels, uh, an onboard battery, a computer, communication systems. You, know, you, can, you can pack a lot into these satellites, just like our phones and our radios have a lot more in them today than they did a generation or two ago. And, and like the slide says, this, uh, this is one way to combat the costs of launch, you know, launching satellites. You know, even though we have more options for launching satellites, it is not a, a uh, buyer's market for launches. There's just so much demand for satellite launches that you know, the costs have not come down dramatically. Hopefully that might happen in the future. Uh, for satellite work, there are many different types of antennas that, that hams use uh, with their satellites. Uh, directional antennas are probably the most common, Yagi's, log periodics, mock sun type antennas. Uh, our satellites don't have the strong signals on their downlinks, so we have to compensate with ant antenna gain or possibly a preamplifier. Uh, there are some omnidirectional designs that hams use, a turnstile or a cross dipole, egg beater, uh, quadrophilia or he helixes or QFHs. And the dishes are more common up in microwaves. A dish for two meters or 70 centimeters would be huge. So 
Yaggies and log periodics and moxins are probably the most common antennas used to, to work our satellites. Uh, when we work our satellites, many times we talk about a pass and you know, a pass is simply the time the satellite is visible in, in your location. Uh, with our low orbit satellites, we don't have a lot of time uh, in these passes. It can be as little as about five minutes. Uh, some satellites in their orbits, we get toward 20 to 25 minutes. And when you're in the footprint, you know, when you're in the pass, that's when you and the satellite can see each other and that's when you can communicate through the satellite. And I'll take this aside because I see Guillermo on screen here. Uh, one thing get away from my house, Guillermo, I hope to work you on RS-44 or A07. I just have too much noise here uh, in my neighborhood, but hopefully soon we'll, we'll make a contact uh, you know, on one of those higher orbit satellites. Uh, in terms of the orbits, uh, almost all of our satellites are in orbits that are slightly elliptical. So there is a high point or an apogee when the satellite is furthest from the Earth and the perigee when it's the closest to the Earth. Uh, most of our satellites are not in perfectly circular orbits. Uh, sometimes this is the way the launch was done and other times like with AMSAT's recent CubeSat satellites, this is to ensure that over 10, 15 years or so the satellites will naturally re-enter the atmosphere and burn up so we're not leaving space junk in orbit for decades. Uh, you know, some of our uh, older satellites like Oscar 10, Oscar 13, and 40, the apogee was out like 35,000 miles, uh, you know, 50,000 miles or more, and the perigee would only be a few hundred miles or kilometers above the Earth, but at Apogee, the satellite could see at least a third of the Earth's surface, uh, allowing for a lot of DX through the satellite. Uh, we don't have any satellites visible to the Americas except for QO100 to our friends in the east of Brazil. And I some people claim St. John's Newfoundland be right on the edge of the footprint of QO100. Yeah. Maybe someone will make that work in the future. Uh, Along with where the satellite is, we have to know how to communicate with it. You know, the frequencies that we use uh, with the satellites. Uh, the easiest way to describe that uh, is using terms of uplink and downlink. Uh, uh, the uplink is the frequency we're transmitting on from the ground to the satellite. And the downlink is the frequency the sat's transmitting on. This is like a repeater input and output uh, except input and output on most terrestrial repeaters are in the same band. And, you know, in our case, so with satellites, there could be voice signals, CW, digital data. At times there are slow scan T and other uh, digital transmission sent through our satellites and sometimes command and control. Like for example, when AO92 has its camera activated, there's a command sent by an AMSAT ground station to turn the camera on. Uh, command and control, we don't talk about a lot. It's there so that, you know, AMSAT, like any owner or operator of a satellite, has control of the satellite to comply with licensing conditions. Uh, and working a satellite compared to, say, the, the local hilltop or repeater on top of a building, there is a Doppler effect on the frequency we use, uh, the frequencies we use with the satellite. Uh, this is like hearing the train whistle as the train's going by, you know, the change in, you know, the pitch of the signal of the, of the noise. Uh, the change in frequency is noticeable when we work our satellites. And the higher we go in frequency, the Doppler effect becomes much more noticeable. You know, for comparison, uh, on two meters, there's a small amount of Doppler shift when we're using two meter frequencies with our satellites. Uh, compared to 70 centimeters where there's three times the Doppler effect compared to the two meter, meter frequency and about three times more than, uh, if you're using 1.2 gigahertz and the higher you go uh, for a lower orbit satellite, the Doppler effect, you know, you're tuning almost constantly. 
Uh, and to compensate for that, the easy way to remember is, you know, for the up, you tune the uplink frequencies up and compensate for Doppler on the downlink, you tune those frequencies down. Uh, along with the, the communications between hams on the ground, uh, many of our satellites send forms of telemetry to the ground. Uh, it can be the status of the satellite, the temperature on board the satellite, uh, what way is the satellite facing, uh, you know, how much uh, voltage is in the batteries on the satellite, how much voltage is coming off the solar panels, any, and any number of experiments that may be carried on the satellite. Uh, many times uh, with recent satellites from AMSAT North America, AMSAT UK, uh, the telemetry is transmitted where simple software, free software, can receive it, decipher the, the telemetry, and upload it to a server so that you know, the, the owners of the satellite can have information about the satellite wherever it's orbiting the Earth. Uh, have been very, very helpful in setting up stations to collect telemetry from not only amateur satellites, but other satellites launched by universities and other groups uh, with a worldwide network of volunteers collecting this information. Along with telemetry, some satellites carry beacons, which is another form of a, a data stream from the satellite. Sometimes these beacons are nothing more than a CW signal transmitting, for example, the call sign assigned to the satellite. Other times there is telemetry embedded in the CW, you know, the numeric information that can be heard for, you know, battery voltages, uh, voltages off the solar panel, the same sort of thing you would get in a digital data stream, but you could copy by ear. And many times we use these beacons, CW beacon, to put the satellite is up from the horizon and we can prepare to use the transponder or other parts of the satellite while it's in view. Uh, talked about different satellites. Now we'll start talking about specifically the satellites that uh, hams typically use. Uh, by far the most popular satellites that hams are using these days are FM satellites. Uh, FM satellites are like FM repeaters on the ground. You know, there's an, an input or uplink from the ground to the satellite, and there's a downlink or the output. Uh, the main difference between the FM satellites and a local repeater is our satellites are cross-band repeaters. Uh, an in-band repeater would be difficult because a duplexer to uh, use uh, one antenna on the satellite is just too big to put on Sat you know, on the frames that we launched for satellites. Uh, the Mir station actually had a, a proper in-band uh, UHF repeater in the late 90s. It was an ICOM UHF repeater uh, with a you know an odd offset, but that's the ex you know really the exception to the rule about you know FM satellites in space are being cross-band devices. We also have linear transponders. These are the satellites we, we normally would use in single sideband or CW. You know, compared to an FM satellite that uses a single channel, uh, these transponders will retransmit somewhere between 20 and 100 kilohertz typically uh, from one band to another. Uh, this, is, this is popular uh, allowing many hams to communicate simultaneously instead of like the repeater on the hilltop or on a building in your community, uh, many hams can make use of the satellite at the same time. Uh, during field day, like field day that's coming up uh, next month uh, in North America, uh, these transponders will sound like HF bands when you tune across them. So many CW signals, single sideband signals, they're busy at other times too, uh, but they'll certainly come alive on field days and other major events. Uh, many hams have taken to software to help uh, you know, automate different parts of their station or just to determine where the satellites uh, are passing by when and when they'll pass by. Uh, you can, uh, 
you can still get the information from websites and from other bulletins, but there's lots of software available for the different you know, computer operating systems. Uh, SAP PC32, uh, that's a Windows program that's offered by AMSAT groups who sell the registration keys as a fundraiser. GPredict is a popular cross-platform program. Mac Doppler for the uh, Mac OS X crowd. Uh, sing, you know, slow scan TV reception is a popular uh, pastime. You know, periodically the International Space Station will transmit slow scan TV and there are programs you can get on Windows, Linux. I, I blanked out on what's the popular Mac OS X uh, uh, program, so I apologize I didn't list that on the screen. And AMS also are interested in copying weather satellites, which are outside the amateur bands, but it's still a satellite, uh, part of the satellite hobby uh, that many enjoy. Uh, along with the computers, uh, mobile devices, mobile phones, tablets, uh, iPods, uh, there are lots of apps that can be used to uh, track satellites, show where they are in the sky, when they'll pass by. Uh, here are a few of the popular programs. Uh, ISS Detector Pro, I'll talk about that briefly because there is a free ISS Detector Pro you know, app available for Android and the Apple devices. The free ISS Detector will track the International Space Station. The Pro version, which is a couple dollar add-on, allows that app to track amateur radio satellites and other satellites. So that one has a small cost to be able to use it for more than the space station. You know, and that Droid Free, like the name says, that's a free app on Android devices. And you can search for satellite tracking in the respective app stores. And there are lots of options, free and those that require a small payment. I've talked a lot, you know, talked a lot about the theory. Uh, you know, it's time to start talking about actually, you know, making use of these satellites. Uh, we have probably at this time in, you know, amateur radio's history in space, more available satellites for two-way communications than we've probably had at any time, you know, since the launch of Oscar One. Uh, right now, uh, for FM satellites, we actually have six active satellites. Uh, I listed them on the screen there. IO-86 is probably not familiar to many in most of North America because that Indonesian satellite orbits uh, closer to the equator. So if you're north of Florida and South Texas, you're probably not ever going to hear that satellite. Uh, AO27 is an old satellite that has been brought back from the dead and it's operating on a rather restrictive schedule over the northern hemisphere if I understood what I read this morning. Uh, PO101 was launched by a group in the Philippines and since COVID-19 its FM repeater has been available basically all the time where previously it was a schedule that was uh, only active once or twice a week over different parts of the world. AO91, AO92, SO50 are available 24-7 worldwide. Uh, single sideband and CW transponders uh, listed in the middle. It's a mix of satellites launched by AMSAT, you know, AO7, Oscar 7 from 1974. FO29 was launched by the Japanese in the mid-90s. Uh, uh, RS-44 was recently, it was launched not too long ago from Russia and has operational, even though the satellite never separated from its booster. And the second column of single sideband CW transponders, all those have been launched by the Chinese in recent years. Uh, the Chinese are putting satellites up sometimes with not a lot of notice. You know, they're giving more notice and getting their frequencies coordinated now so we have a better idea of when those satellites are, are going to be launched. And then we have satellites for digital modes like the uh, packet APRS Digipeter on the International Space Station. Uh, FalconSat was a satellite operated by the U.S. Air Force Academy and turned over to, you know, for management by AMSAT you know, for amateur radio use uh, a while back. We have a lot of satellites uh, compared to just 
few years ago where we only had a couple FM satellites and a couple single sideband satellites and not much more. Uh, for the FM satellites, you know, like I said, this is the you know, most popular way you know, hams get started on the satellites. It usually only takes an HT and some sort of directional antenna. Uh, the directional antennas can be purchased from stores or you know, lots of designs online. We'll talk about that a little more. And even the Baofeng HTs that come from China, uh, there are hams that will use those radios to work satellites. So it brings the cost to try this part of the hobby out down dramatically. If you use something like you know, the inexpensive handheld radio and you build an antenna, gone are the days of having to spend thousands of dollars to get a big radio or a pair of radios, big antennas to try out this part of the hobby. Uh, the handheld radio, if it's a dual band, two meter 70 meter radio that many hams already have, can be the starting point of working satellites uh, with just the addition of a better antenna. Uh, and here are those six satellites I mentioned. Uh, the, most of this, you know, it's, it's a split right now. Some of the satellites use a two meter up link and a 70 centimeter down link. You know, AMSATS AO91 and AO92 along with PO101 reverse that and use a 70 centimeter uplink and two meter downlink. Most of them require a PL tone to uh, activate the satellite and or talk through it. Uh, AO27 is so old it did not require PL tones when it was launched in 1993. Uh, so you know, lots, of, lots of different uh, choices on that part of the hobby. Uh, single sideband CW satellites. If you need a, you know, a transceiver or a transmitter and receiver capable of single sideband or CW transmissions. Uh, older radios, you know, Kenwood TR9000, you know, the original ICOM IC706, uh, which did not transmit on 70 centimeters. You can use that work the handful of single sideband CW satellites that use a two meter uplink. And the downlink can be done with the relatively inexpensive SDR dongles or other software defined receivers. Uh, of course, you can use other, other radios that receive on 70 centimeters to be the downlink and the antenna, you know, similar antenna than, that you would use with the handheld radios will work for these radios also. When you switch the uplink and the downlink and you go to 70 centimeters for the uplink, uh, the IC706 Mark IIG, the final version of that radio and other radios like the FT857s, the FT817s or the current FT818s are viable options. You know, the downlink can still be Receive using a software defined receiver like the uh, RTL dongles, or you can use a pair of radios, you know, a pair of IC706 Mark II Gs or FT857s. My normal go to setup for these satellites is a pair of FT817s I've used for over a decade, but I have also used software defined receivers to hear the downlinks. I've used the all mode receiver the Kenwood THD74. I have an ICOM ICR30 receiver that does a very good job with satellites. You know, combinations of radios, and they don't have to be new radios. Uh, radios you'd find at Hamfest or on the online uh, swap sites or uh, selling sites uh, many times will get you the radios without having to pay the price of new equipment. And here's an example of the SAT PC32 program uh, tracking the uh, tracking uh, FO29 and the frequency list uh, showing the different uh, single sideband satellites. And you know the uplink and the downlink in this case is the center of the transponder. The transponders are anywhere like AO7 has a 50 kilohertz wide transponder. Uh, FO29 when it's operational has a 100 kilohertz wide transponder. 
And the CAS-4 and the XW-2 satellites typically, you know, they have 20 kilohertz transponders, still enough to support several simultaneous uh, contacts, you know, without everybody stacking up on a single frequency. And of course, AMSAT, you know, you know there are lots of places on the internet to get updated lists of frequencies. Uh, AMSAT maintains separate lists for the FM satellites and the linear satellites, the single sideband CW satellites on its website. You know, nice charts that can be viewed. You can print them out or save the charts to your computer or your device and have them with you. I did talk about antennas earlier. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little more about them here, uh, especially, you know, for the, you know, those starting out who want to use their handheld radio, yes, you can use your uh, ducky antenna or you know ducky antennas on a couple of radios to work satellites, but those antennas are usually not uh, the most efficient. Uh, you can buy antennas from the dealers. There are there are a few options for antennas that you can purchase, you know, handheld or larger antennas. But there are also many homebrew designs that you know you can search on the internet and get the design. You may already have the components to build the antenna, or if you go to the hardware store, you may spend a few dollars uh, and be able to get the parts without having to spend, say, a hundred dollars to hundred and fifty dollars to buy an antenna uh, from one of the dealers. Yeah, here's a picture. It's actually from one of my demonstrations at a ham fest earlier this year. Uh, I'm using the ELP as a dual band log periodic. It's five element antenna. My left hand is holding an old ICOM dual band HT and that strap you see on my left, that's actually one of those straps for holding a phone or an iPod. You would strap it to your arm while you're jogging or working except I strap it down by my wrist to put my phone in to show me where to point antenna toward the satellite. Uh, it's a, a friend of mine suggested that and I use that rather than setting my phone down on the ground while I'm working a pass and either forgetting the phone or stomping on the phone and then having to go purchase another phone to replace the broken one. Uh, but this was a demonstration done outside uh, in February and this was AO9 do. I believe on this pass, I had talked to about a dozen stations from Mexico to Canada as part of the demonstration. Uh, another ex example of a homebrew antenna, but it does look very similar to a commercial antenna made by Aero Antennas uh, here in the U.S. Now, uh, this was an antenna made by a Mexican ham, uh, Leo XE3 Alpha Alpha. Uh, he uses the red bow antenna in the picture. I worked him on that. I asked him what his uh, setup was by email after our contact and he sent me this picture. Uh, looks like a very, you know, very good equivalent or copy of the dual and Yagi you can buy in the store for $100 to $150. Uh, like I said, design Line searching your favorite search engine for homebrew AMSAT antenna or homebrew satellite antenna. Uh, here are some examples of links with those designs. The first link, uh, Ken Britton WA5BJB, also referenced on the AMSAT website. Uh, you know, antennas that you can build from parts. Accessories. I could go on, you know, maybe not as a, a workshop by itself, but satellites the different accessories we use to round out our stations. Now, the upper left is a splitter. Uh, depending upon the radio, uh, you may want to plug in a headset or earphones along with a quarter, or maybe you want someone else to be able to listen to you while you're working the satellite. Uh, a recorder, a uh, very common way to keep track of activity on a pass, especially if you're out in the field holding your radio in one hand and holding your antenna in the other hand, you're, you're not writing things down. And unless your memory is very good, you might forget stations you've made contact with. Uh, the diplexer, uh, they can be used as bandpass filters. 
if you're dealing with harmonic issues when transmitting on two meters and the satellite band something 70 centimeters, almost a perfect third harmonic, uh, you can use a uh, diplexer as a filter. Headsets or head, headset boom microphones, uh, many times satellite operators use those uh, to have a more convenient way of working their radios. A compass to know which way is north, a uh, GPS receiver uh, to show your location. This is an example of my Garmin E-Trex uh, GPS receiver where you can configure latitude, longitude, grid locator, and the accuracy of the received GPS signals on one screen. Of course, you can get an app on a mobile phone or tablet that will show you your latitude, longitude, or your grid locator. You can also have an app on a phone or a tablet to record. Uh, you can use the record, you know, the microphone on those devices, or sometimes you can run a patch cable to those devices to get a cleaner recording. Lots of operating tips. You know, don't be overwhelmed by what's on the screen here. Uh, I put a reminder at the very top to open the squelch. Our satellites do not have the strongest signals on the downlink. It's not like using a local repeater. Uh, for example, the SO50 satellite transmits at a quarter of a watt. Uh, AMSAT's AO91 and AO92, it's usually just over a half a watt. Uh, these signals are readable, they're just weak. And of course, uh, for the FM satellites you know, where PL tones are required, make sure those are set. Otherwise, you may not be able to get through the satellite even though you're hearing it. And of course, like anything else you know, in amateur radio, listen before transmitting. Uh, many times, especially in the populated uh, parts of the world, um, you know, certainly North America, U.S., Canada, Mexico, and toward the Caribbean, there's almost always somebody on a satellite, even late at night. Uh, so many times, it, if you're listening, you'll hear something. Uh, but of course, there are times in the middle of the night where there, that might not be the case. Uh, there's no need generally to think of running 50, 100, 200 watts on our satellites. Uh, lower power levels are great. Uh, the dual band handheld radios or HTs in general, five watt radio should be more than enough. Uh, on our transponders uh, for single sideband and CW, CW signals can be cranked down dramatically and still be perfectly readable through the transponder. Uh, lower power, especially in CW, is a very efficient way to communicate, just like it is on HF bands. Uh, like many will say for using a local repeater, uh, there's no need to call CQ on an FM satellite. You know, just transmit your call sign and your grid locator. Uh, if it's really quiet, you could also throw in city, state, city, and province. Uh, if you're in the Caribbean, what island are you on? That will probably draw people out if you're in a, a rare location. And if you hear activity and you're calling, your, you know, giving your call sign, red locator, and you're just not making contacts, uh, rather than continuing to call, pick out a station you're hearing, call that station. That will certainly signal to others listening that you can hear the satellite. You're calling somebody else who's been heard through the satellite. And many times that's you know, an invitation for everybody else to start calling you, especially if you're new to working satellites. And of course, point the antenna to the satellite and, and do the tuning to compensate for Doppler. Uh, usually, uh, unless you're on computer control, we're doing a lot of the tuning on 70 centimeters, whether it's the uplink or the downlink, because the Doppler effect is much more noticeable on that band than two meters. Uh, whenever possible, full duplex operation is the way to go. Uh, since our satellites are cross-band repeaters, uh, whether it's an FM or single sideband CW, uh, the satellites are receiving on one band, transmitting on another band. So that gives you the opportunity to hear yourself, unlike using a repeater that receives and transmits on the band on a hilltop where that's difficult to do, if not impossible. So you can figure out a way that you're getting through the satellite simply by uh, listening while you're transmitting. 
if you do operate old duplex, uh, earphones, headphones, uh, earbuds, even putting a speaker out a few feet or a couple meters away from you, uh, something to separate the receive audio from your microphone so you don't cause a nasty feedback loop while you're transmitting. That squeal is obnoxious. Uh, most people will politely let you know that you're doing that, but you know, sometimes you might get the not so polite email, you know, reminding you of that. Uh, most of the time, our contacts on satellites are, are pretty simple. We're exchanging call signs and grid locators. Now the grid locator being a shorthand for our latitude and longitude and you know, maybe somebody knows uh, the largest cities like you know, Los Angeles, New York, Toronto. Uh, they may not know Phoenix, Arizona, or certainly not the small communities here in my state. But if I give them a grid DM43 or Delta Mike 43, now they can look on a map or become familiar where, you know, with where that grid locator is, you know, just by ex giving four characters instead of a longer description of my location. Uh, the recorder or the recording app on a phone or a tablet, uh, that's a good way to keep track of activity on a pass. Even if you have a pen and paper and you're set up where you can write things down, it may, it may not hurt to run a recording at the same time. Uh, that way you can go back to the recording later. And even if it's just a recording of your own voice and not of the downlink uh, that you're receiving, as long as you're saying the other station's call sign with every contact you make, that's still a record of your activity on that pass for logging and ultimately for confirming contacts. And most of all, uh, you gotta have fun with this. You know, it's fun to get on the air. There are people who are just happy to hear other people on, or maybe they hear somebody they know, they're trying something different. Uh, you gotta have fun. And I can tell you a lot of people have been trying this corner of amateur radio lately with the uh, lockdowns or stay at home orders or the quarantine orders, uh, maybe, for the first time, others are coming back to this facet of the hobby after many years. Uh, but there's been an increase in activity, certainly in the last couple months, but room for more. With that, I've, I've come to the end of my slideshow. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, comments. Uh, I don't think any daggers can come through the screen here. Uh, uh, Augusto, I, I think I will stop the, uh, the screen sharing and let, let you do whatever you need to do at this point. Hello. Okay, sorry about that. Stop the screen sharing. Okay, um, sorry, but we, we've had a, a few glitches with the YouTube interface, so uh, I'm just getting everything ready for the Q&A. Thank you very much. You can hear me okay, Patrick? I can hear you just fine. Okay. I see a still photo video. of you and not video, but I hear you fine. Yeah, you I'm sorry for that. Yeah, it's been quite spoiled uh, tonight. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the uh, YouTube interface to work, so uh, it, it has only been Zoom. Uh, I will have to upload the video later to YouTube from uh, the Zoom meeting. But okay. anyway, thank you very much for a great presentation. It was extremely interesting. And I'm sure people who are here will uh, have a few questions. Um, so let me change this so everybody can unmute themselves now. Give me just one second. Yeah, uh, anybody who wants to ask a question uh, can probably just press the space bar if they are on a computer and start talking and asking their questions. So uh, go ahead and again, thank you very much, Patrick, for an extremely interesting uh, presentation. 
Thank you. It's it's an overview. I mean, you know, it's yep. not uh, like a full day workshop or something, but you know. No, but it's great for people like me who really don't know satellites yet. It, it's great to get an introduction to it. So I, we appreciate it. Thank you. So anybody has questions, please go ahead. I have a question, Patrick. Uh, this is Ed KW4GF. Good evening. Hello, Patrick. Actually, there's two. One is, um, I heard you use phonetics, and I heard you hear just, I used just clear. Is it easier to use phonetics on satellite, or is it both? Um, on single sideband CW, just like on HF, phonetics are probably the way to go. Uh, on FM, uh, if if the uh, downlink is clear, uh, you could go with without phonetics, but certainly if you go with phonetics and you're not speaking, you know, rapid fire, you know, giving your call once in phonetics may be better than, you know, if you said KW4GF and, and somebody has to come back with who's the KW4 or who's 4GF, and, and then you have to repeat. Uh, it's situational awareness. If I'm making a contact with somebody I know who I've worked many times, I will probably skip the phonetics and quickly do the call signs, uh, you know, just with letter. Uh, so, you know, rather than just saying it depends, and hopefully that gives an, you know, an sure. explanation on, you know, at times where it might be better to go with phonetics versus just, you know, the, English letters. And if you're working stations out, outside of the English speaking countries, like, in, you know, you know, good evening, Ramon. Uh, many Mexican hams know QSO English, but, you know, they will do better if you go with phonetics and digits. You know, like when I was saying my grid locator, uh, if I say Mike 4-3 uh, in English, uh, many Mexican hams will understand that. If I say 43, uh, sometimes they'll understand that, you know, depending upon their grasp of the English language. So phonetics and digits will go a long way, especially when uh, working hams where English is not their primary language. The only other question I have is um, holding the antenna up and, and ac accommodating the uh, Doppler effect. I saw where you say that you hold that antenna up towards the satellite, but what happens with that Doppler effect? Are you seeing that in real time on the computer or your phone? I, you can, you know, some software will actually show the frequency, you know, accounting for Doppler. Uh, oftentimes I don't have that set up on my tracking app on my phone and I'm not using computer control, you know, but I can go by hearing the, the voice change and that will give me a, a guide to you know needing to adjust my frequency in single sideband that's a more you know that's a constant thing on the fm satellites you know you're not having to tune as often at least with two meters and 70 centimeters but you can start sounding off you know either you have to adjust the downlink or your uplink frequency will have to adjust to compensate and then your voice will sound better or the other voices will sound better. Thank you, Ed. Anybody else uh, with questions, please go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering, this is uh, Whiskey Papa 4 KVX Hulu Hotel from Puerto Rico. I hope you can hear the coquis in the back. <laughs> I hear them and you fine. <laughs> yeah. I was kind of wondering about the uh, potential for emergency communications using satellites. Can you say something about that? I mean, that's a topic that was uh, uh, taken in, a, in the previous uh, uh, Yaru meeting here in, in Zoom. And I was wondering if there's a, they, they could be tied together, these two topics. I knew sure, now. sure. You know, I remember seeing that question come up in the uh, keyboard chat on the Zoom session last week. And I'll offer a real world uh, example of the use of satellites. You know, keeping in mind our satellites are in lower orbit, so we only have a few minutes at a time to use them. Uh, the current AMSAT president, Clayton W5PFG, and his father were in Big Bend National Park last summer. And they were driving, you know, in large part so Clayton could operate from a rarely heard grid locator 
near the Rio Grande River and the Mexican border, except their truck got stuck in mud. They couldn't, you know, you know couldn't get it out. Uh, they were far enough away from the uh, park administration where mobile phone coverage was non-existent, not even coming from the Mexican side of the border. But Clayton knew when the satellites were passing by, and he had everything scripted out where he made contact with the ham who was, you know, either at home or, you know, he was near a phone and passed information uh, on their location, latitude, longitude, and what road they were on. Uh, gave the phone number of the park administration over the over the satellite. Explained, you know, two males. They had food and water. You know, the the two of them were fine, but the truck was stuck. And you know, that ham and a couple of others called Big Bend National Park administration to report this. And a couple hours later, park rangers drove out to where they were stuck, pulled the truck out, uh, and they were able to. You know, you know, leave that area. The, the article about this is on AMSAT's website. Uh, it was posted last, you know, this happened in, I believe it was late August last year in 2019. And the article actually had links to audio containing the, the exchange over the AO92 satellite where Clayton was relaying all this information. It was all relayed in a matter of about two minutes. Clayton would transmit a little bit, break, and pause and then he would continue and verify you know that all the information was received and then showed up on other satellite passes mainly to uh, you know allow people to know that he he and his father were doing fine until the park rangers made their way out to uh, to their location uh, for our friends in europe africa and with q0100 it's a different matter with a geostationary payload you know, you could have a station set up using Q0100 without regard to HF propagation or, you know, propagation at all you know, for a 24-hour a day link. Uh, there have been projects to trying to do something similar here in the Americas, and AMSAT was part of an effort of that that would have involved a satellite launched by the U.S. government, but that project had been postponed with no you know, no set plans on when it might, you know, might come back and that satellite be launched. Thank you, Victor. Gracias. Patrick, uh, Jack Dodds, VE3 UKD here. Evening, Jack. Um, yeah, one thing that I'm really curious about, I, I, I just finished building an antenna uh, or part of an antenna and I hope I'll be handheld I hope I'll be doing some satellite work, but okay. um, the these satellites are they stabilized at all? Are they tumbling in orbit? And I'm wondering about, you know, some of the uh, two meter, seventy centimeter uh, antennas I see have the two meter part and the seventy centimeter part at right angles. Uh, others I've seen don't have them at right angles, and I'm wondering. Uh, is there any sort of stabilization of the satellites? And what does that uh, have to imply for the um, polarization? And the antennas on the satellites, are the uplink and downlink antennas usually polarized in the same direction or cross-polarized? Can you fill me in on that? Sure. In, in terms of the antennas on the satellites, uh, I will offer the short answer. It depends, you know, it depends on the satellite, but let me explain. On some satellites, you now the antennas may be little more than whips, you know, coming off different faces or corners of the satellite frame. Uh, there may, you know, some satellites have circular polarization on their antennas. Uh, AO91, AO92, the popular FM satellites, has a six inch or 15 centimeter whip off one face of the satellite. And on the opposite side of the satellite, it has a 19 inch or pardon my metric conversion, something in the neighborhood of 50 centimeters, uh, basically the equivalent of a two meter quarter wave whip on one side and a 70 centimeter quarter wave whip on the other side. Now in the case of those satellites, uh, the, the uplink receiver on 70 centimeters is only using that that six inch or 15 centimeter whip, 
where the two meter downlink is using the two meter whip as one side of a dipole with the slight frame and the 70 centimeter whip as the other side of the dipole to have a more efficient antenna. Uh, unlike your local repeaters, uh, our satellites are not stabilized so that the polarization will always be vertical or horizontal. Uh, they do have a tumble to them even with some stabilization even if it's just a magnetic rod mounted on or inside the satellite frame. So there will be times if you're holding your antenna in one particular orientation, the signal will fade out and then fade back in. Uh, you can compensate for that by twisting the antenna if you're holding it or if it's mounted on a tripod and you can twist or maybe flip it 90 degrees uh, to compensate for that and then the signal would fade back so you could you know, twist the antenna back to the way you had it previously. Uh, that becomes reflexive over time, but at first, yes, it, you know, it, it can be uh, different, if, especially if you're used to, you know, VHF, UHF terrestrial repeaters. The antennas are always vertical, you know, on FM without fail. Uh, we're using FM, but our antennas can be all over the place. And uh, people will catch me or they'll ask me in demonstrations if I'm even realizing I'm twisting the antenna. And honestly, at times I'm not, you know, it, it just becomes a, a reflex. You know, if you hear the signal dropping, you just, you know, just twist your, twist the antenna in your hand uh, to compensate and away you go. And what was the first part of your question? I was focusing more on the satellite side and I, you know, I don't think I covered the first part of what you asked. Well, that's a great answer, uh, but uh, you really got me curious now because you were talking about how there's a magnetic rod in some of these satellites which helps stabilize it, which sounds really interesting, uh, and I wonder how successful those are. The satellites, you know, the, the antennas are not stabilized like you would see with communication satellites, like direct TV network, and pardon my ignorance of the... Uh, uh, the satellite television providers north of the border, uh, where those antennas are, are stabilized because those satellites have rocket motors to keep the antennas focused in one direction so that you can mount your antenna on, on your house or near your house and not have to mess with it. Our, our satellites are not nearly that complex. They're not that big. They're not carrying rocket motors. Uh, but the stabilization helps you, may, you know, to slow down the tumbling. Uh, our satellites will still tumble, but you know, sometimes the stabilization is only, it's trying to keep the antennas pointing in a certain direction, for example, toward the ground and not you know, have you know, the antennas waver away from the ground. Uh, but it's not gonna be as stable as using you know, the tel satellite television receiver to, to watch your television. But with practice, you, you can, you know, you'll get used to it. Thank you. You're welcome. We have two people. Uh, I'll go and uh, Jose Arturo, Yankees here, one Mike's here, and then we have Kilo Tango, one Juliet. Please go ahead. Roger. Hi. Um, Henry, K2 on J in Vermont. Good evening. Are you, are Can you, you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear both of you. Okay. Hi, hi Patrick. Thanks for the great presentation. I haven't heard you in a while up there. Do you have any comments on the quad helix antenna? Is it, is it uh, useful for that one? The helix antennas? Uh, there are hams that use them, usually for the higher frequencies. For example, with AO92, when the 1.2 gigahertz or 23 centimeter uplink is active, uh, there are many hams that have either been building uh, uh, helix antennas or they're purchasing them. I don't know if there's a vendor here in North America that uh, makes helix antennas. I know some buy the, the Wemo antennas from Germany and have them shipped over. Uh, that is a popular popular antenna. Uh, you know, I don't know of, really I don't know of anybody that's using the helix antennas, uh, you know, at two meters or 70 centimeters, unless they're building something 
you know, you know, similar but different, like an egg beater antenna or a turnstile to receive uh, satellite telemetry, and they don't want, you know, a tracking system with a rotator. Uh, does that does that and get to uh, what you were looking for, Jose? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Gracias. KT1J was on the screen before. And I thought you know you had a question. I'm sorry, I missed your name when you were up on screen previously. Yes, this is uh, Henry KT1J in Vermont. Me, Henry. Um, my question. In compensating for the Doppler, this can be done on the receive side by tuning up on the on on the trans uplink tuning up on the downlink tuning down. Is there a standard practice which side gets adjusted? Uh, the standard practice is more of making the adjustment on the higher frequency, regardless of whether it's the the uh, uplink or the downlink, because that's where the Doppler effect is more pronounced. Uh, okay. For, for AO91 question. and AO92, you're transmitting on the higher frequency, so that's where the adjustment is made to uh, tune across 18 to 20 kilohertz from start to finish on a pass. Uh, other satellites, you could get away with making no adjustments on the uplink if you're on two meters, but tuning the downlink on 70 centimeters to compensate for the Doppler. Uh, and software on computers or really well-skilled operators can tune both uplink and downlink to uh, compensate for Doppler, especially for single sideband and CW to maintain the same frequency of the satellite as opposed to on your, you know, on the dials of your radios. Excellent. Thank you, Patrick. Good session. Thank you. Anyone else with uh, questions? Yeah, I, I think a good yeah, has left us working on. Oh, there he's back. I thought for a minute he was still playing with YouTube. Uh, it's not cooperating, is it? Mm -hmm. Okay. I haven't, haven't seen the recording pop up on the screen uh, like I did a week ago. Uh, I see a recording, but I don't see the reference to YouTube tonight. Yeah, no, what, what happens is that uh, the interface between Zoom and YouTube Live hasn't been working today, apparently. Uh, there's an outage. So we okay. couldn't do the simultaneous uh, cast. But what I will do, since we have the cloud recording, uh, which will finish when we stop the session. I will upload that to YouTube so people who wanted to see the uh, uh, the presentation on uh, YouTube will be able to download it anyway. Okay. I, I have a, a comment. Hi, Ramon. Yes. Pat, I want to thank you. I am Ramon Santoyo, X-ray Echo 1 Kilo Kilo President of IRU Region 2. We are delighted to have you here because there are few satellite operators that are more knowledgeable than you. I have worked on so many times, so many places, always with a very good practice standards. In, I have worked on in Canada, in Mexico, in the U.S., uh, so, and on various satellites. So we were delighted to have you a week ago on, the, on this same uh, presentation when uh, Martin and uh, Guillermo uh, made an excellent presentation in Spanish. And uh, we want to thank you for, in such a short notice, being able to provide such a good uh, session tonight. Thank, thank you very you. much, Pat. I, I, don't, I don't know who, who was lined up to be the uh, presenter for this English uh, language workshop before, but I'm happy to do this. I do this for groups here in the US. I used to do this in Mexico about 10, 12 years ago when I could get a permit down there to operate. But, you know, I was happy to do this. Uh, I was happy to, you know, try to keep a consistent presentation with what was given last week. So uh, there's not a no, huge we, we really thank you. And, and for IRU Region 2, the satellite topic is a very important topic, not only because if you are a satellite operator, as Pat and many of, of us are, uh, it's a very enjoyable uh, part of amateur radio. 
but also it's uh, the new frontier for many young uh, amateurs who uh, like not only to operate satellites, but to build the satellites uh, in colleges and universities. And that bring new blood to uh, our, uh, our hobby. And I think that's, uh, that's something that we all need to be very proud of it to be. Uh, we have been in the peak of technology since uh, the start of uh, amateur radio and with satellites, I think in a way we are still holding the flag high. So we need to continue. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Ramon. Anybody has any other questions? I think Francis maybe? Yeah. Yeah, I got a question, I know I pop you up. Good evening, Francis. Yep. Yeah, good evening. Well, I, I'm Francis, and I might pop it up shot. I want to know which is the easiest way to find yourself on, a, on the SSD satellite, the uplink and downlink, which is easiest way to find yourself on that satellite. Meaning okay. that the, to find yourself where, where you is on frequency on the satellite. Okay. What, what I do, you know, keeping in mind, I'm not using computer control. I do my operating manually. Uh, what I usually do is try to pick a clear frequency on the downlink and using, you know, reference chart, I have a chart that's you know, laminated card I keep with me so that I can see what the approximate uplink should be for that downlink frequency. And I'll either talk or, or quickly send some dits through the transponder. And when I can hear my voice or my dits coming through, uh, I, I know where I am. And from that point for that pass, I can move around the transponder or just stay put and call CQ and try to attract attention you know, to me at that spot. But as long as I'm keep, you know, moving and, you know, transmitting periodically, if I want to move five kilohertz down on the downlink, uh, our transponders invert typically. So I would have to tune the uplink up five kilohertz and as long as I do that quickly and transmit, then I'm not having to make further adjustments to Doppler, you know, compared to m moving five kilohertz or 10 kilohertz, waiting a while, and then transmitting at the new location on the transponder. Uh, computer control makes that easy because you can just say, tune your downlink receiver and the software will adjust your transmit frequency automatically. Uh, but with many will, will at least want to do that manually to be familiar with it, even if they're building a station that, you know, will use computer control or even computer control in the field, you, you know, laptops or some tablets mm -hmm. have enough processing power and can be interfaced with, you know, radios like the FT, even the FT817 and FT818 have Yesu's cat ports on them, like the larger HF transceivers. So they can be computer controlled. Usually computer control stops at that point. You know, when you get to HTs or the FM mobile radios, you're almost exclusively on manual control. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else with a question, comment? Yeah, um, Patrick. It's yes. It's nine Zulu four kilo mic in Trinidad and Tobago. A um, couple questions. One is, um, and you forgive me, I, a student of mine had a little crisis, so I might have missed if you treated with this. Um, one is, are there case studies of the use of AMSAT um, in emergencies? And, uh, well, yeah, let me ask that first and then, yeah, and then we go. Okay. Well, there is an actual real world example of using an amateur radio satellite in, a, in an emergency. I talked about that a little earlier involving a ham and his father. Well, they were both hams, but uh, these two gentlemen were stuck in the middle of a national park, a very remote location in the state of Texas last summer, and mobile phone coverage wasn't available you know, in Texas or coming across the border from northern Mexico. So using uh, an amateur radio satellite, you know, in about two minutes worth of transmissions, relayed you know, his location, gave the phone number to contact the National Park uh, Administration office, uh, their location, the, the road they were on with latitude and longitude, 
uh, mentioned they had food and water, they had their provisions so they could wait a while. Uh, you know, had somebody else in another location call the National Park to report their situation and within a couple of hours, park rangers came to tow them out, tow the truck out of the mud and they were able to get out of that part of the park. Cool, thanks Jamel. And my other one was, um, are there any opportunities at the moment for um, collaboration on a CubeSat launch at all for, you know, for, per, for persons in the Caribbean region who may be interested? Uh, that's a, that's an interesting topic. And I say that because you know, HAMS used to have worldwide collaboration on satellite projects. Um, many, you know, most of our satellite projects until the last decade or so, uh, even if it was something built by AMSAT here in the United States would have involvement, you know, from HAMS in Canada and much of Europe and possibly from the Far East, from Japan. Uh, regulations and laws here in the U.S. change, which make it difficult if, you know, and at one point almost impossible for HAMS here in the U.S. to collaborate on projects outside of the U.S. and conversely having non-U.S. HAMS participate in projects here. Uh, there are collaborations outside of the U.S. I do not know of any specifically involving uh, you know, amateur radio groups or universities in the Caribbean, but that is not unusual uh, because there are groups all around the world, whether it's amateur radio or universities or other school groups who wish to uh, build satellites and have them launched. And they'll many times work with local amateur radio groups or get in touch with groups in other countries to help with, you know, whether it's uh, advice on building the satellites or getting them launched. Uh, AMSAT here in the U.S. actually uh, ran into some trouble in the late 2000s on some of its collaborations with groups outside the U.S., but thankfully regulations and laws are changing where we may be able here in the U.S. to work once again with HAMS outside the uh, U.S. without, you know, mountains of paperwork uh, to deal with with the U.S. government. Cool. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody has any other questions, please? Uh, yes, me. Please go ahead. Uh, you listen, Patrick. I hear you. Hello? Okay. Okay. Good evening. Uh, uh, Ramon, Augusto, and Patrick. Uh, Patrick, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is John. Uh, call sign is Yankee Victor Phi, India Uniform Alpha, Venezuela. Um, I only uh, like to talk the here in Venezuela um, with Argentina and some countries from America made a basic course for satellites in January, February. And it was wonderful because maybe 240, 100 uh, take the, the, the training for WhatsApp and Google uh, for, for, for this uh, um, only WhatsApp and, and Google uh, information. No? And now, for example, in Venezuela, we have a 90, 90. Uh, three months ago, only five, but now have a 90 uh, hand radios in the satellites. And in America, in Colombia, uh, Peru, um, Peru, no, Colombia, um, Puerto Rico, Mexico, and some countries have a, a new hand radios in the satellites. It's, it's a fever. Uh, if you listen now in the FM satellites, it was wonderful. This is very good. But now uh, we prepare the the next course at advanced advanced satellites. We like to talk the other other uh, um, uh, satellites in SSB and Charlie Whiskey satellites in digital uh, for uh, telemetry and packet and 
other other important things. No? Uh, for example, the CubeSat satellites. Um, any, we we write you and Ramon and the other hand radios to for help. Okay, for we need okay. uh, some uh, help for practice the SSB satellites. I listen some satellites, but it's it's not easy to to practice. But now we have uh, experience with the FM satellites. Is is easy? Is the people is very happy, but we like to mm, take the next step for the advanced right. satellites. And Patrick, uh, thank you. And I, I will write to you uh, for help for okay. this course. Okay. Thank you. I, I will I will be happy to help. Uh, Guillermo X Ray Quebec Three Sierra Alpha, who has been uh, attending tonight's presentation. He was a presenter last week for the Spanish workshop. Uh, he is regularly operating in single sideband from Lima. Uh, you know, he, he is certainly, you know, I will be happy to help even though uh, Spanish is not my, uh, my primary language, I can get by. Uh, I know there have been more Venezuelan hams working satellite. I may not hear them here in the southwestern part of the United States but I do hear and read about, you know, all the uh, Yankee Victor and uh, Yankee Yankee stations that are being worked by uh, hams in the Eastern U.S. and and in Mexico. It's good good to see that, and you know, shows that the FM satellites are popular, and you know, it's not an, it, it's not expensive to try out satellites that way. But it's also good to hear that there's an interest to do more, uh, to try other parts of the satellite uh, corner of amateur radio. And I would be happy to help you. And certainly make sure you're in touch with you know, Spanish speakers who would also be willing to help uh, in your efforts. We're in already contact with John uh, Patrick and we start to support them and their team, don't worry. Perfect. And like I said, I, I'm happy to help where I can uh, in terms of actually getting on the air. The single sideband satellites are probably a better opportunity for me to make contacts with Venezuela than in FM. Uh, just the geography in the Western U.S. is not, does not favor me, but I would be happy to, you know, help in, in those efforts. And when the time comes, uh, hopefully hear these stations on and make contacts with them. Okay, thank you so much. And um, for example, we have a contact with from Canada to Argentina in FM. Um, it's more easy to SSB. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Gracias. Buenas noches. Anybody else, please? Somebody asked about an intermediate and an advanced course on this. Uh, we will set up for anybody who's interested we will set up other uh workshops on intermediate and advanced not only on satellites on anything we do is not just getting an introduction we want to get people as much information as uh, as as we can as time permits and we just need to get the people who are kind enough to do these workshops uh so thanks for that you may be on on, on a hot spot on this one and have to go the extra mile and do the other ones if possible we will all be very grateful for that. And uh, th the only thing we're looking at right now is, is if we are going to continue doing this on a weekly basis or if we're going to spread them out a little bit more. Uh, that's something we're working on right now. But apart from that, I think everybody's happy. We've had, I think it's five uh, workshops now and we have at least three or four more in, in line and we haven't gone into any intermediates yet. So that's good. And people have a lot of time now being at home. Uh, it's good for everybody to be able to learn a new thing and we can all learn something every day. I'm learning about satellites. I knew nothing about satellites until the, the first workshop. So this is great. To thank him again for my part. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Pat. Gracias a ti, Ramon. Thank you. Delighted to have you here. Hope to, that you come back soon. <laughs>